Amen. So that was quick there. Now we'll go into the word. Hallelujah. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay. Bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came. And you gave amazing grace. Thank you for the blood, Lord. Thank you for your nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. We crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus' Son. Of God, darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. That is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We come before you, we approach your word with reverence and with expectation. We ask, O oh God, that you will speak to us out of your word. We ask, O oh God, that you will grant me utterance, the ability to deliver that which you have placed on my hand, on my, on my heart, with boldness, with accuracy. Give me the ability to articulate it clearly in a manner that you will be glorified and that your people will be blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So the topic of the sermon today is the preaching of the cross. The preaching of the cross. And our foundational text is from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greek foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory, in the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen. 
So I want to start by saying, if you're a believer in Christ, you are on the right side. If you are not yet a believer in Christ, his arms are open to you and he will be delighted to receive you. Jesus said in John 6, 37, John 6, 37, that him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So his arms are open wide to you if you are not yet in Christ. So what is the preaching of the cross? We can paraphrase this to mean the reason or the message of the cross. What does the cross mean? So there are four things that I would like to share. Number one, the cross is the means by which Jesus redeemed us from the curse or the penalty of the Lord, of the law. The cross is the means by which Jesus redeemed us from the curse or penalty of the law. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16. It says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The cross is the place where the sinless Christ paid in his body the penalty demanded by the law. So we're, when we talk about the law, we're talking about the law of Moses with its rules, its regulations, its ordinances, which are described here as enmity or hostile. In Colossians 2 verse 14, Colossians 2 verse 14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. So the penalty was against us. The ordinances were against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. How was the law against us? James 2 verse 10. James 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So the, under the law, unless you could accomplish and fulfill every single demand, then you were guilty. If you were guilty of one, you were guilty of all. So you might say, I didn't steal. I didn't murder anybody. I did not commit adultery. But did you take something that didn't belong to you? Have you ever offended by your word? Have you ever harbored an impure thought? Have you ever done anything as little as it may be wrong? If the answer is yes, then I say to you, you need Christ. You need Christ. You, you, you can't say, oh, I'm 99% good or I'm, I'm only 1% bad. You can't even say I'm 99.99% .99 good and one just a little tiny bit bad. If you have ever sinned, if you have ever done anything wrong, unless you can live a speckless life, you need Christ. Amen? Amen. Galatians 3, 10 to 12. Galatians 3, 10 to 12 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things, all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So as long if you're an if, you, if you're in the law, you have to do everything, 100%. You have to be faultless to be saved. But in the law of faith, we look to the cross. Amen. So we all are faced with this choice. Do we want to live in Christ or under the law? Do we want to live in Christ or under the law? Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The law was given so that we could see how guilty we are 
before him. Romans 3, 9 to 10, and also 19 and 20. Romans 3, 9 to 10, and also 19 and 20. It says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, not one. Now we know, this is verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. That means that we can't boast. And all the world may become guilty before God. So when you look at the requirements of the law, we are all guilty. Unless we've done it all, we are all guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. When you read the law, you realize I've gone wrong. You realize that I cannot attain righteousness of my own self. I have no righteousness of my own. My righteousness is filthy rags. That is why we need the righteousness of, of God to be imputed to us. And the sin, our sin, was imputed on Christ on the cross. Hallelujah. So, by the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. We now have a better covenant. Hebrews 8, 6 to 7. Hebrews 8, 6 to 7. It says, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, if we could accomplish it, if we could meet his requirements, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the cross is the means by which Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Number two. The cross is where Jesus reconciled man to man. Yes, you heard me right. Man to man. The cross is where Jesus reconciled man to man. The law was given to the Jews. So we see in Psalm 147, 19 and 20. Psalm 147, 19 to 20. He says, he showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. As for his judgments, they have not known them. So he revealed his word unto Jacob, unto Israel. Romans 3, 1 to 2. Romans 3, 1 and 2. Says, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So God committed the oracles, his ways, his statutes, his judgments unto the, unto the nation of Israel. God in his sovereignty chose to reveal his ways through the Jews. He decided the path of salvation. So we see Jesus stating in, in um, John 4.22 that salvation is of the Jews. God in his sovereignty, he could have chosen any tribe any nation. He could have chosen Afghanistan. He could have chosen Mongolia, Nigeria. He could have chosen anywhere else. But in his sovereignty, he chose the nation of Israel. Amen? He didn't need many messiahs. He only needed one. So some people raise the argument, well, before, the, before Christianity came, we had our ways, we had our culture, we had our tradition. Um, why do we now follow the white man's God? I've heard that being argued. Well, if God wanted to, to, to appease that argument, he would have raised Messiah for Messiahs for every culture. One Messiah for the African, one Messiah for the North American, one Messiah for the European. But he only needed one. One Messiah, which had to originate from somewhere. Romans 5.15. Romans 5.15 says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, 
much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded to many. So that one Messiah died for all of us, not just for one culture. So although God chose to bring revelation through the nation of Israel, through Christ's work on the cross, Gentiles, I, non-Jews, everyone else other than the Jews, were also brought near to God. Ephesians 2 verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who, who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So in Christ, the two, and when I talk about the two, the Jew and the Gentile, have been made one. We see in Ephesians 2.15, where we read earlier, it says to make in himself of twain, the two, to make of himself, the two, one new man. So make him peace. peace. So in Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you are one in Christ. Amen? I hope that makes sense. Galatians 3, 27 to 29. Galatians 3, 27 to 29. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And here's according to the promise. So in Christ, arguments about tribe, nationality, origin, they become irrelevant. We are one in Christ. The cross is where Jesus reconciles man to man. Amen. The number three, the cross is where Jesus reconciled man to God. The cross is where Jesus reconciled man to God. In Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Mankind's sin caused a separation, an alienation between God and and man. We were guilty and reconciliation was needed. The work on the cross makes those who are in Christ unblameable in God's sight. Colossians 1 19 to 22. Colossians 1 19 to 22 says, For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, he made peace through the blood by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You know, salvation demanded a sacrifice and Jesus was that sacrifice. So in, in his presence now, as we accept that price that was paid, as we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're saying, okay, my, your Lord, your righteousness is imputed unto me. My sin is imputed unto, unto Jesus. He took the penalty for that sin. So now we are unblameable in the sight of God. So the cross is where Jesus reconciled man to God. Number four, the cross is a point of focus and remembrance for every believer. The cross is a point of focus and remembrance for every believer. Hebrews 12, two and three. Hebrews 12, two and three. As looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So we are always to keep the cross in focus. The Greek word for looking, looking is af aphorao, af afra, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Afra, which is A-P-H-O-R-A-O, -A -A which means to consider attentively, to consider attentively. You know, there is a tendency for us to focus on man. There are many who have been in faith where their faith has been destroyed because of, a hu of human flaws. Someone they held in high esteem has disappointed them or has sinned or has fallen. And they've just concluded that this thing about God is untrue because a man, a man has fallen. You know, the Bible encourages us in Ephesians 4.1 that you walk worthy of the vocation where you are called. So as believers, the, 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 the Bible wants us to live lives that, are, that give glory to God. But nonetheless, it is paramount that we continue looking unto Jesus and the work that he wrought on the cross, not unto man. Because if you, if you elevate a man and you put a man on a pedestal and he falls and he comes short, you can be disappointed. So if I'm preaching the gospel now, and what an awesome privilege it is to preach the gospel, but look not unto me, look unto God. Because if you find out I'm doing, I've done something wrong or I do something you don't agree with, you should not allow that to shipwreck your faith. Look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. In Matthew 24, 12 to 13, Matthew 24, 12 to 13, Jesus said, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How do we endure to the end? By continually looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The very reason, the very reason we need Christ is because of our imperfections, the imperfections of man. Looking, reading from Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17. Matthew 19, 16 and 17. It says, And behold, one, ki one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. So this might seem an odd statement for the sinless Christ to make. Is he saying that he's not good? No, that's not what he's saying. The essence of what he's saying here is that you cannot be good except that you are God. You cannot be good except that you are God. What he's not saying is that he's not good. So in fact, he states his goodness so clearly in John 10, 11 John 10 11 he says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep so Jesus is actually confirming his deity he's confirming his deity the only way you can be good is if you're God so if Christ is good then Christ is God so if we put our gaze on any other thing or any other person than on Jesus, then our view of the cross will become hazy. So look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your, say, of your, of your faith. Hebrews 12.3 again says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. What is that contradiction? Why would someone who is free from sin have to pay the penalty for sin? It's a contradiction. Why would those of us who are sinful receive the righteousness of God? It's a contradiction. But the Bible is saying that we should always consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied in your, and faint in your mind. So the cross is a point of focus and remembrance for every believer. 
Amen. So all I have said so far is foolishness to those who perish. How we view the message of the cross defines our current status with regards, with regards to eternal life. So reading again 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The Greek word for perish is apolumai or apoluo, which in this context means to be destroyed eternally. The Greek word for foolishness is Maria, which means absurdity. So the thought that someone's execution, and that's what it was, that's what, that's what it was. It was an execution of Christ on the cross. The thought that that could bring salvation, it seems absurd to an unbeliever. To those who are perishing, it seems absurd. I mean, it seems ridiculous to them. However, Trusting in this message brings the power of God into our own lives. The power of God. I mean, what can redeem you from sin? There's no other religion, as far as I understand it, that can deal with the issue of the burden of sin. What do I do? Is it if I'm 55% good and 45% bad, I enter into heaven? Is it 99%? Is it 80%? The cross is the only thing that deals with that issue. The thought is, is a, it's just ridiculous to those who do not believe. Now, most translations, the translation I tend to use most is the King James Version. But most, most other versions, for example, the NIV and I think the New King James, they render this, this passage in present continuous tense. So, for instance, the NIV says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god this indicates a work in progress that it's a continuing thing each of us is heading in one of two directions there is no middle ground we are either being saved or we are perishing there's no middle ground you know you may have heard me say this before that in the kingdom of god there's no neutrality you're either for God or you're against it. You can't say, well, I'm neutral. There's no neutrality in the kingdom of God. Matthew 12, 30. In Matthew 12, verse 30, Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You're either for Christ or you're not. There's no middle ground. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21, again. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So here Paul is quoting Isaiah 29 verse 14. He's quoting Isaiah 29 verse 14, which says, Therefore I, pro I proceed to do a marvelous work among this people even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. The marvelous work on the cross cannot be understood through, his, through human wisdom. The marvelous work of the cross renders human wisdom useless. It destroys human wisdom. Wisdom. Mankind has always and they will always tender arguments against the message of the cross. They argue from the point of human logic. However, the message of the cross has rendered human logic redundant. Psalm 33 verse 10. Psalm 33 verse 10 says, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen 
to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. So that word for heathen in its plural form in the Hebrew is goyim, which is used to describe pagan nations. So it's a generic um, word used for those who do not believe. He says it will bring the word of those who do not believe to naught. So many so-called intellectuals in their eloquence have tried to discount or dismiss the work of the cross. They may sound impressive, they may sound knowledgeable, but they are words, if I use the words in Jude verse 12, Jude 12 says clouds without water, trees without fruit, twice dead. Human wisdom, knowledge or philosophy has nothing to offer you when it comes to the matter of salvation. Nothing. It's empty. There is no eternal fruit in it. You cannot get to know God through human wisdom. You can't. Verse 21 of the of 1 Corinthians 1 that we've been reading said, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Earthly wisdom cannot get you to understand or to know God. You look to the cross for that. You see, there is a difference between godly wisdom and earthly wisdom. James, James 3, 13 to 17. I read from James 3, 13 to 17. It says, who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have better, bitter envying and strife in your hearts, Glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is up from above is first pure, then peaceable, gently, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Jesus declared in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So any wisdom that strives and lies against that truth, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, is earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. Worldly, Wisdom cannot bring you salvation. Human, human philosophy cannot answer the question, how do I deal with the burden of sin? The issue of eternal salvation cannot be solved through human reasoning. God's wisdom is higher than man's wisdom. Isaiah 55, 8-9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The wisdom of this world is fleeting and is temporal, ever-changing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that came to naught, that come to naught. Earthly wisdom comes to naught. When it comes to matters of, of eternity, earthly wisdom comes to naught. Godly wisdom, however, is everlasting and, and it's unchanging. Godly wisdom is everlasting and unchanging. First Peter 1.25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you, the word that endureth forever. Psalm 119 verse 89, Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Going back to 1 Corinthians 1 from 22 to 24. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greek foolishness. 
But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So in, con in context, the unregenerate Jew represents the religious minded, while the unregenerate Greek represents the intellectual minded. The message of the cross, which says that there is no other means to God apart from Christ. We just read it from John 14, 6. That's an offense to the religious mind. What about my religion? What about my gods? What about my traditions? What about my culture? To the religious minded, the message of the cross is a stumbling block. 1 Peter 2, 6-8. 1 Peter 2, 6 to 8 says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is become the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. It offends them when they hear that this is the only way to salvation. The religious mind is offended. Even to them that stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. The religious mind seeks a sign. Jesus said in Matthew 16 verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish. Jesus was prophesying his death and resurrection after three days. The thing about those who seek signs is that signs are never enough. If you look at Matthew 15, 32, 39, Jesus had just fed 4,000 with seven loaves and a, little, a few fishes. Is that not a sign? But immediately after in Matthew 16 verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees asked for a sign. What more signs do they need? Signs will never be sufficient for a darkened heart. The, light, the heart needs to be illuminated. I was saying to my, to my wife this morning, little things that just fall into place. God just takes care of little things. A heart that is illuminated will be thankful for the things that God does. But a darkened heart will never be grateful. They will put it down to convenience. It was bound to happen. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Coincidence, that's the word I'm looking for. But a, 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 an enlightened heart, an illuminated heart will be thankful for God. There's evidence of God everywhere you go. In the trees, in the, in the bees, in the, in, in, in the children you see, even in us, the diversity, the way that God has created everything together. But the fool says in his heart that there is no God. The Jews seek signs. To the intellectual, the message of the cross is absurd. Do you really believe that? They will say. The message of the cross is not expressed in high academic or philosophical terms. In the days of Paul, he visited Athens, which is the capital of Greece, which at that time was an intellectual hub. We read from Acts 17, 15 to 18. Acts 17, 15 to 18. It says, and they conducted Paul, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what would this babbler say? Other some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Paul had to debate with the devout, the Jews, and the, and the intellectuals, the Greeks. The intellectuals saw the preaching of the cross as babbling, babbling and strange. We get the same response today. The intellectuals mocking and rejecting God's word. 
the, the intellectual mind will say, prove to me that God exists. Psalm 14 verse 1 says, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God. Even though there is evidence all around us, the darkened hearts cannot see it. Psalm 19, 1 verse 2. Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's evidence of God all around us, in the skies, in the trees, in the nights, in the moon, in the sun. You can see it in the blessings of your family, your children. You can see God all around you if your heart is illuminated. Uh, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who believe, both Jews and Greek, Christ crucified is the power of God. I remember uh, an elderly gentleman, Uncle Tony, we used to call him. He used to be part of a ministry that I was part of. He said, it takes more faith not to believe in God than to believe in God says that it takes more faith to believe that there's no God than there is God. Because it's easy. The evidence is all around you. But if there is no God, it's absurd to me as a believer. How did all this come to be? By chance? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. I'm reading here 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. There's a lot more I was going to say. But I want to say this, if you have not yet given your life to Christ, you need to do so. How do you move from being a natural man, a man of the soul, to a man of the spirit? Your heart needs to be illuminated with the preaching of the cross. Your heart needs to be illuminated with the preaching of the cross. The very thing that the natural man considers to be foolish. So I think I might need more time to finish this message. I was hoping to finish it today. But this is what I will say to you. It is incumbent on you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because the decision you make today will determine where you spend eternity. No matter how long we live here on the earth, there will become a day when our time here will expire. And where we spend eternity will be determined by whether or not we embrace this preaching of the cross. If you die in your sin, you will spend eternity in hellfire, in eternal damnation. May that not be your portion. But if someone has to pay the price for your sin, it's either you pay the price yourself or Jesus Christ pays it for you. The only acceptable sacrifice. So I will appeal to you this morning. If you have not given your life to Christ, today is the day of salvation. If you want to do that, I will ask that you pray this prayer with me. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Come into my heart. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you pray that prayer, then what you will find, you, 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 I will say welcome to the family of God. God will give you a new spirit. I've not been able to explain that today. Hopefully in the future, I'll be able to bring some expansion on that. But it's very important that you start to relate with other believers. That is how you are built up. That is how you understand the impact of what you have done, lest the enemy take away what you've been given. So I will ask that you contact us on our email, which is info at dominionchapel.org.uk so that we can start to disciple you and we'll start to build you up in the faith of our King. Amen.
And for those of us who are already in Christ, I want to encourage us, continue looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So by the grace of God, I'll be able to do part two of this in a few weeks' time. Amen. 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 Let's give God thanks.